with the Lord's Supper, we sing, Dear Lord and Father of mankind. We'll sing all, all verses. Let us pray. Dear God in heaven, we come here this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us of our sins, that you might hear this prayer that we offer this morning. Our prayer is a prayer to hallow your name, and to honor you as the one true and living God, to praise you as you have asked us to do. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, to be a sacrifice to save us from our sins. We thank you for loving us so much that you would send him. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving God and loving us, being completely obedient that you would leave the splendor of heaven, come to this earth, take the form of a man, and experience all the things that we do but yet without sin to be that perfect sacrifice we thank you Lord Jesus for keeping your word and sending the Holy Spirit to guide us through this life and we thank you Holy Spirit for being the ultimate guide and putting in place on that day of Pentecost the plan of salvation that will be there until our Lord and Savior comes again. For all who will hear, believe, and obey, they can be saved. We pray, Lord, for strength for each one of us as Christians and those who have obeyed that gospel. We pray that you give us strength to share that word, try to bring other people to Christ. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are sick. We pray, Lord, that you would heal them. 
We thank you for the healing that has been done on others. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless this congregation. Help us to grow in the faith and knowledge of your word. Help us to have the strength to serve you as you have asked. We pray, Lord, for this nation. Please be merciful to it, Lord, and save it. We pray that you defeat all these people who are trying to tear it down and take your word out of our, our recognition, honor that you deserve for creating this nation, giving it to us. We have so many people who are turning their back on you. We pray, Lord, that you give us strength to stand for you. And again, we ask, would you please be merciful? We pray for all those in law enforcement that you would help them, Lord, watch over them. For those who are in military, those who are in foreign places, standing up for us, we pray that you watch for them. For those poor souls who are still left in those, in Afghanistan, other places, those that are Christian and are being persecuted, we pray, Lord, you give them strength and ability to deal with everything that comes to them. We pray, Lord, that you find some way to help them to have relief and just give them strength to stand by you and stay faithful until the end. We pray again, Lord, for forgiveness of our sins. And we pray that you give us strength to obey your word and to study your word. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless us in the future as you have in the past. We thank you again, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice that we could be here this day as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray this prayer in your most holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we um, are mindful as we gather around the table, the body of Christ that was sent to this earth, lived a perfect and sinless life, the body that was scorned, the body that was 
beaten, bruised, and ultimately died on the cross for our sins and broken on the cross for our sins. We pray that as we partake of this loaf that is in representation of Christ's body, that we're able to clear from our minds any worldly burdens and worldly cares. And I pray that we partake of this loaf in a well-pleasing manner under your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you again, continuing this prayer. As we focus on the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins, the blood that uh, was spewed upon the cross of Calvary on our behalf. Lord, we, we pray that you be with us now as we partake of this cup. This juice from the fruit of the vine that is in representation of that blood. Pray that we partake of this cup in a well-pleasing manner unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come before you again, thanking you for all the blessings that we have here on earth. Blessings both great and small. Lord, everything that we enjoy in this life is great because it does come from you. Lord, we pray that you be with us now as we take this opportunity to give back to you, give back to your work here on earth. Pray that the funds that are given today are used to uh, broaden the borders of your kingdom, to help those around us, and be, um, be used to bring souls back to Christ. Lord, we pray that you be with each and every one of us as we give today. Pray that we give with a cheerful heart, that we never, never forget that um, every blessing that we have uh, comes from you, and that we never take anything for granted in this life. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 through 18. <clears throat> now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you.
Good morning. It's good to be here. Good to have you with us. And if we have visitors with us, we're glad you can be here as well. You know, if someone were to ask you, are you happy? Are you happy? How would you answer? Most of us probably say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Are you? How are you doing? I'm just fine. How are you? But if we were to answer honestly, at times, I think most of us would say from time to time, you know, I'm not really that happy. There's circumstances that I'm going through right now that are making life difficult. There are things that have happened to me or things that I'm dealing with or, you know, I'm just not very happy at the moment. But I hope that even when difficulties are there, I hope even when life seems to be against you at times, that down deep inside there's still an underlying joy, an underlying peace, an underlying rejoicing. Mark read just a moment ago from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and at the end of that passage in verses 16 through 18, it tells us to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Here's God's will. It's not just what I want for you or what you want from me. This is God's will for you and God's will for me. God's will is that we are a prayerful people. You know, we pray together, but we need to pray uh, by ourselves as well. We need to be people that pray in good times and bad times, in easy times and difficult times. In everything, give thanks. Don't just pray, but be thankful in your prayers. Take time to give thanks to the one who gives us all spiritual blessings, that every good and perfect gift comes from above, that ultimately everything good ultimately comes from God. And, and so we pray, we give thanks, but also it's God's will that we rejoice always. Oh, there's times that we'll shed tears. There's times that life will be difficult. There's times that we may not feel all that good. There are times that may be easier than others. But as I said a moment ago, hopefully within our heart, there still abides a rejoicing, a joy that is there that cannot be taken away. As Philippians 4 and verse 4 says in the previous chapter, um, excuse me, in, in a different, actually a different book, um, from our scripture reading a moment ago, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Oh, there's difficulties in the world. There's tribulation. But we can be of good cheer because God's overcome the wor world through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, with the blessings that we have in Christ, the hope that is ours, we can be joyful. Joyful, rejoicing, rejoice always. Why should we rejoice? Well, we've touched on that some. I want us this morning to think about a little bit about why we should have that underlying attitude of joy. Why, should, why we should rejoice. I mean, sometimes people say, what do I have to be happy about or to be joyful about? Well, there's a lot of things that we have to be joyful about. I want us just to touch on a few, and then we'll make some points from that. These, these aren't everything, but there's some places that talk about things that give us joy or may rob our joy as well. Why rejoice? Because we have peace. You know, you think about the world we live in. In the world, there's tribulation, yes. I mean, Billy talks about in his prayer some things about our country. And, and you think about the way in our, people in our country have acted and reacted to the blessings of God. They've taken it for granted. They've ignored it. They, they've turned their back on God. There, there's trouble in politics. There's trouble internationally, nation to nation, and within our nation as well. We live in a world where people are not at peace with one another, and then you begin to talk about peace of mind and contentment, and that seems so far away. Why should we rejoice? Because as Christians, we can have the peace that passes understanding. As much as possible, we live at peace with all men. Ultimately, we want to have peace with God, and that gives us that peace within our heart as well. In Romans chapter 5, it puts it this way in the first two verses. Therefore, having been justified by faith. I mean, we stand condemned, but now through faith in Jesus, obedient faith through the blood of Christ, we are justified. Ultimately, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. He said, because of what we have, because of the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary, the, the sacrifice that we remembered a moment ago in the Lord's Supper, we have justification. Because of that, we have peace with God. Sin separates us. We're at odds with God. We're separated with God. But in Christ, we have peace with God once again. We can have a home with God in heaven one day. And he said, because of that, we rejoice. We should be joyful. We may not have anything else in this world, but if we can have the right relationship with God and the hope of a home with God in heaven, 
you know, be at peace with God. I mean, that, that should give us that peace that passes understanding that no matter what the difficulties in life, there's that underlying peace that is there. And it gives us that attitude of rejoicing. Also, we mentioned that as well in that verse, there is hope. You ever feel hopeless? Sometimes we feel hopeless and we may feel like we're in a hopeless situation, but we have hope that anchors our soul. We don't give in, we don't give up. We have hope in Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, there's a number of things that are mentioned here. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, sometimes we hope things will work out. We hope this will happen. We hope that person will come through for us. We hope that we will get this job or, or that we'll be able to have this other thing work out the way we want to. And, and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a more sure hope than others. But it says the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, the hope that God has given to us, is a living hope. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He rose up from the dead never to die again. And so he's saying to us, you can have victory in death. You have victory over death. Just as Jesus rose up never to die again, we can rise up to not die again. And through the blood of Christ, we can have access to heaven and have an eternal home in God, with God in heaven. And so there's hope that is there. No matter what this world throws at us, we can rejoice because I've got hope of a better life one day in heaven. You tie in with you know, that as well. Why do we have peace? Why do we have hope? It's because our hope's based on the reward that will be ours one day. Go back to 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. He says, we have that hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. You ever had something that's precious to you? Maybe, maybe it's some item that's been passed down from generation to generation, and then you lose it. I mean, you think, hey, it's precious, but I've lost it. Or maybe it's stolen. Or maybe you have something that's precious to you that you, that you like and, and it breaks. You realize it, it's useless now. Uh, things deteriorate. Things crumble. Things break apart. Things are stolen. Things are lost. But it says when it comes to our inheritance in heaven one day, it's incorruptible. It's undefiled. You know, it doesn't fade away. It's a forever home there in heaven. And so we rejoice because of that reward that's there to be with all the saved of all the ages, to be with, the, with God in heaven. We rejoice as well because it can't be taken away from us. You know, sometimes we have something and again, it's stolen. Again, it's, it's taken away. Or maybe we're promised something and, and they say, well, you know, um, I, uh, I, I didn't realize that I promised that to you or I forgot but it says that inheritance that we have, 1 Peter 1 again, verse 3 through 6, that inheritance that we have is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. You ever made reservations, maybe for a hotel, and you call the day that you're supposed to go to the hotel, and they say, we don't have those reservations. You know, you're not in the system. We don't know what happened. And maybe they ask you for proof, and even if you show the proof, they, they say, well, no, we don't have it in our system. Or maybe you say, well, I don't have the proof. You never sent me anything in it. For whatever reason, those reservations have been canceled. They're not any good. Maybe you've made a reservation in a restaurant and had the same thing happen. And that's frustrating, isn't it? It's frustrating if you miss out on a, a place that you're supposed to stay on a vacation. It's frustrating if you're expecting a good meal and you don't have the reservations that are there. But it says when it comes to the all-important reservation in heaven, it's reserved for us. And as long as we're covered by the blood of Christ, as long as we're you know, in the light... It can't be taken away from us. Satan what doesn't have the power against our will and against God's will to cancel that reservation. You know, Satan doesn't say, well, hey, look, I, I booked ahead of you or whatever, I mean, or I, I canceled your reservation. Now, we can turn our back on God and miss out. You know, we can cancel the reservation, as it were. We can let sin separate us from God, and we don't have that. You know, we can go back into the world once again. It says, you made that reservation in heaven. You're kept by the power of God. And people may threaten us, and they can kill this physical body. They can cause us a lot of grief in this life. 
but they can't ultimately take away from that, from that reservation that we have that's kept by the power of God in heaven for us. And so we rejoice. That place of reward, that place that was reserved for us is a place where the tears will be wiped away, where there will be eternal rest. And usually we go to the end of the book of Revelation. I want us to go back to the first part, kind of toward the middle maybe. Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 through 17. And it gives that same picture there. One of the elders answered saying, Who are these that are arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? And I said, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He said, you know, here's ones that have had great tribulation, and many of those people were dying for the cause of Christ. And, and we may not have to give our life for the cause of Christ, but we may. But we have tribulation in the world. In the world you have tribulation. I'm just, we have it in different shape, forms, or fashion. The scriptures are clear on that. It may not be life and death, but it can be a lot of troubles and trials. We come out of great tribulation, but hopefully our robes are washed in the blood of Christ. You know, we're a child of God. We're a faithful child of God. The blood is cleansing us. And he says the end result of them is they're before the throne. They serve him day and night in this temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That, that tells you that we're going to have tears in our eyes here. Even Jesus wept. We'll have times of, of being very hot and sweaty, tired and thirsty, hungry. Those tears will come. There will come a time in heaven where we can rest from our labors here. God will wipe away those tears from our eyes. There won't be that sadness and sorrow anymore. We rejoice looking forward to that time as well. The ultimate enemy, you think about Satan, but Satan's ultimate weapon, I think there is death. You know, the physical death that we suffer. I mean, you know, that, that enemy that's there, we don't like looking forward to death. Uh, maybe we look forward to eternity, but that process of getting there, dying and death is a terrible thought. But for a child of God, there's even blessings in death. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, the scriptures say. Paul said, Philippians 1, 23, I'm hard pressed between the two. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. He said, I'm needed here, but I'm looking forward to going and being with Christ. I'm looking forward to my life here on earth to be over because there's blessings that come beyond death. There's that victory we have over death. There's eternal life that's waiting for us. Even when we die. Oh, there's sorrow, but we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We have hope in Christ Jesus that we talked about a moment ago. And so there are many reasons to rejoice. There's, there's so much more we could talk about, all the spiritual blessings that are ours, but ultimately that hope of a home with God in heaven one day. And yet some don't rejoice. What keeps people from rejoicing? Again, a lot of things we could talk about, but what do we allow to keep us from rejoicing at times? It might be sin in someone's life that keeps them from rejoicing. We can bring a lot of problems on our life by sinning, by making wrong decisions, by doing sinful things. You know, we can run with the wrong crowd. We can, we can go to the wrong places, do the wrong things, think or say the wrong things as well. The psalmist in Psalm 38 looked at his life. And he said, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. He said, God, I understand my relationship to you. I understand I have sin and, and your anger toward me, but I, I'm sick about my sin. My iniquities have gone over my head. I'm just, you know, over my head in sin, drowning. Like a heavy burden, they're too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. And sometimes we can allow sin to pull us down. You know, people go out for the pleasure of sin and the enjoyment of sin, but they, they look at the consequences of sin. You know, you know they, re they reap the consequences that are there and they're not good. I mean, and he said, the guilt that's there, the problems that come, and, and you look at, you know, sometimes on TV they glorify sin and make you see all the happiness, but you don't look at the the end result of the pleasure of sin are for a season. And sometimes people want to go for that pleasure of sin that's for a season, and they don't realize the end consequence. It's not going to be
pleasurable or enjoyable. And it can rob you of joy to be caught up in sin and sinfulness. Maybe it's a matter of submission as well. You know, do you like to be told what to do? Most of us don't. Sometimes, you know, you say, I don't know what to do. Please tell me. And you appreciate the help. But most of the time, it's like I can handle it by myself or I can do it. And, and we don't like that authority that is there. Some people rebel against all authority, whether it's in the home or at school or at work or with the government. It, but ultimately, we need to be careful that we are submissive, not only to the powers that be when it's not against God's will, but ultimately that we submit to God. In Hebrews 13 and verse 17, it says, Obey those who have rule over you. And in this case, he mentions the elders. I think, I think it's what he's alluding to here. Be submissive, he says. That submissive attitude. You know, there's humility that takes place there. You know, we look at the shepherds of our flock here at Liberty. That they watch for our souls. They're concerned for us. Because they have to give an account one day. And that's an awesome responsibility. And he says, let them do it with joy and not with grief. That's unprofitable to you. You know, we can give people a lot of hard times and difficult times when they're trying to do their best to do what's right and to rule in the right way and to, and to watch out for our souls. And we can be very difficult at times with that. But it says that's not profitable for them, not profitable for you. It robs them of joy. It robs you of joy as well. But those same rules really apply to God ultimately, doesn't it? And even more so that we obey the one who rules over us, that we're submissive to him because he cares for our soul. He wants us to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. But we do have to give an account one day. And we want to be able to be joyful on that day of accounting, on that day of judgment. But sin can pull us away from that submission and a lack of it. Submit ourselves to the will of God. Don't rebel against it because God cares for us. But the world pulls. There's allurement to the world and worldliness. And our heart might be divided at times. You know, Moses had a choice to make. Will I enjoy the pleasure of sin for a, a season? Or go and suffer with the people of God? Think about what all he could have enjoyed in Pharaoh's household, what all he did enjoy, the power, the prestige, all the wealth that that world had to offer at that time was at his disposal. If he had just gone along with what Pharaoh wanted, what Pharaoh's house stood for, and, and had turned his back on the people of God and ultimately on God, think about all the blessings he could have had. But he understood what we need to understand, and that is that the pleasures of sin don't last forever. There's consequences. You reap what you sow. Where's your heart? You might say, well, I love God. I believe God's word is true. I know what I need to do to be saved. I understand what the Bible tells me to do to become a Christian and, and to live in a worship. But then the world comes calling, and we want that as well. In James chapter 1, he's, he's talking about wisdom here, but he lays out a principle. If you lack wisdom, ask God, who gives all men liberally and without reproach to be given to, to him. God gives us the things that we need. I mean, we... You know, there's things that we need to go out and, and that we can do on our own. I mean, if we need knowledge, he's given us his word that we can open up and study. But we pray for wisdom to understand it and apply it to our lives and make right decisions, and, and God helps us. But he says, as we approach God, as we ask God of anything, ask in faith with no doubting. As we live our life, as we approach God's throne, as we live day in and day out, we live our life with a strong faith. Don't, don't have those doubts that are there. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You know, here's a person that wants to put their trust in God, but they don't to totally trust God. You read what God's Word says to do, do we truly trust that, that that's the right way? And when God tells us how to be saved, that that's really right? When God tells us the right decisions to make and the wrong ones to make, then we look at that and say, I believe in God, and I'll do it God's way. Some people really don't have the joy that they could have in their life, the contentment and the peace that they should have in their life because they really hadn't put their full trust and devotion in God, and there's a divided allegiance. And it may be just from a lack of trust in God, but also it can be a, a matter of the world and worldliness as well. And that brings to the last point, that's materialism. Materialism. Where is your heart? Where is your mind? Where is your focus? In the parable of the sower in Luke 8 and verse 14, it talks about the thorny soil. The ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, talking about the word of God, they, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, 
and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. You know, that divided allegiance or maybe giving your full allegiance to the world. I mean, we get so caught up in the world. Maybe it's making a living. Maybe it's getting those extra things. Maybe it's just enjoying life, the pleasure of life. There's the cares that come our way. Maybe it's the love of riches and things riches can buy. But he said, here's that materialistic attitude, materialistic heart, where that becomes all that we focus on. And the problem is it chokes out what is good and right. And that is the hope that we have in Christ, the forgiveness that's there, and ultimately that joy that's there in this life and in the life to come as well. Why don't some rejoice? Well, it might be a sin problem or an attitude problem, a heart problem. It might be a matter of where our focus is and what's on our mind. But so many do not rejoice. So what's the answer? What is the answer? Let's go back to what we looked at a moment ago. The answer is to understand why we rejoice, that we can have peace with God, that we have peace. If you're a Christian, a faithful child of God, you have peace with God. You have that peace that passes understanding. You strive to live at peace with man because you have a hope that anchors your soul of an eternal reward in heaven one day that no one can take away from you. That's sure and steadfast. The promises of God are sure and steadfast. God does not lie. It's a place where there'll be no tears. A place where we rest from all the labors and troubles of this life. For even as we take our last breath on earth, we realize <coughs> that even in death, there are great blessings. There's so much to rejoice about. There'll be troubles and trials. There'll be sadness and sorrow. But underneath it all, we have an abiding joy because we have a hope that anchors our soul. Again, go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's God's will for you. God's will for us. What's God's will for us? That not anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're not a Christian this morning, God's will for you is that you come to repentance, that you believe in Jesus as the Son of God. You're penitent of those sins. And you come to Christ looking for forgiveness. As you're buried with him in baptism, his blood cleanses you. You rise up in newness of life. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, you can go on your way rejoicing this morning. They can bring great joy to you knowing your sins are forgiven. But now you're a child of God. But then God has his will for us as children of God. That we keep contact with him as we study his word, as this scripture says, as we pray without ceasing. Maybe as a Christian, you don't have the joy that you did. You might look at your life and say, look, there's problems here. I need to really commit myself to Christ. I need to, I struggle with some of those things we've talked about this morning or other things as well. But you have an opportunity as we sing an invitation song in a moment. If you need prayers, if you need forgiveness, if you need to become a Christian, it's, it's a good opportunity for you at this time. While you have time to make your life right. And then all of us can rejoice and we can all go on our way rejoicing this morning. If you need to respond to the invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?
standing for the verse of this song, and after this, we'll be seated for the final prayer. We'll sing the first verse of Our God is, he is Alive. We appreciate everyone that's here this morning. Uh, we are shy a few people, and we certainly hope that we'll check, everyone will check on those and, and, and make sure that they're okay and can get back with us uh, as soon as we can. But I appreciate your joining in the service this morning, and I uh, appreciate your being here. We have visitors, and certainly happy that you are here this morning. Sing one verse of our God, if he is alive, and then we'll be led in our closing prayer. <laughs> 